So, you want to work in a zoo? Well, you're in the right place. We're going to be talking to zookeepers, researchers, conservationists and many more people about their careers. We will discuss how they got into doing what they do now and of course we'll be asking them for their advice to those that aspire to work with animals or for animals and the natural world. So, I will uh, hand it over to you now, Joe. Okay, so a lesser known side of zoos is just how much involvement we have with conservation of species in their native habitat. So this is known as in situ conservation. So I'm really excited today to be able to talk to someone who is directly involved in this for Wild Planet Trust. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm incredibly envious um, of the jobs he's done and the places he's been, um, as well as the real impact he's had on conservation. So we're gonna be finding out some of the amazing places that, uh, that he's been to, but more importantly, what I wanna know is how do I get to go there too? So that's that's my <laughs> aim for the podcast today. So welcome Harry to the podcast. Hi, go on Ollie. Go okay, so classic intro. Um, obviously you are Harry, but who are you <laughs> and what do you do, Harry? Well, thanks, Ollie. Um, so, yeah, I'm Harry Hilser. I'm the programme director for Selamat Kanyaki, mm -hmm. which is Indonesian for Save the Macaques. And it's a conservation programme. Um, originally started out here from the Wild Planet Trust, Painton Zoo. And it's with the aim of protecting the critically endangered Sudawesi crested black macaques, or macaca nigra, and yaki as they're known locally. Mm. So yeah, I've been running this, this program since 2012 with mm -hmm. incredible team on site in, in North Sulawesi in Indonesia. And um, yeah, it's been wonderful and very enriching life experience to have spent such a long time out there. So yeah, I look forward to sharing a bit more about that. I also have some other roles I'm okay. involved with. So um, I'm also running a environmental education consultancy here in the UK called Lestari. And I also am a research fellow at the University of Exeter, where I studied my PhD part-time. I'm sure we'll have a bit more time to... Amazing. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll get all that. into that. Before mm. we get to that, though, what is the weirdest job that you've ever had? The weirdest job I've ever had? That's a great question. So, well, I spent about two years at a place called Stichting Arp, which is in the okay. Netherlands, in Almere. And um, I was working, it's, it's a rescue centre for exotic animals. Mm. And I worked with all sorts of yeah, incredible animal species, mostly primates, so yeah. uh, vervet monkeys and uh, Barbary <laughs> macaques, and there was chimpanzees there as well, oh, so amazing. very noisy in the hall there. But when I was walking, uh, working in the quarantine for, for a, a while, um, I got fascinated by a football team of uh, marmosets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my role was to... to give them care as they were in their quarantine period. Um, and there was 11 individuals of marmosets which had been confiscated from the wild animal trade, which unfortunately is still quite prolific in, in throughout Europe. Um, and um, there was one little baby as well, so one little infant <laughs> marmoset, which is a tiny little thing. Um, and I was just fascinated by giving them these little, all these little grubs, little worms, and uh, just mesmerized. They were like, where's Harry? We've got this we've got this uh, team meeting. And it was like, oh, he's still in there, fascinated. <laughs> 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 bleary eyed over this little tiny little marmoset. So that was certainly one of my uh, stranger ones looking after the football team of marmosets. Amazing. And I can tell that, yes, you are very jealous, Joe, because you were a primate he's keeper. Primate <laughs> yeah. Language. Yeah. yeah, I'm jealous as well, but I can imagine you more so. Okay, but, yeah, but the other reason I think I'm excited to talk to you is most people that we talk, are going to be talking to and have talked to, I've got a rough idea of, of where they've been, what they've done, and things like that, because mm. obviously they're, they're direct colleagues that I see daily. But mm. with you, no idea. <laughs> so, um, so I think if we start with, with your role within Selamat Kanyaki, and mm. that's a, a word I can say very fast because I've said it many times. <laughs> um, um, so within that role, how long have you been doing that role directly with, with Selamat Kanyaki? So I originally went out to Indonesia in January 2012. So that's 10 years, right, just right. over, yeah, um, this January. And I moved back to the UK, so I've been based back here since uh, last, uh, well, um, August 2020, actually. Yeah. So um, the last year and a half back here in the UK to, to work and sort of focus a bit on the consultancy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I've been otherwise mostly full-time based there in Menado yeah. in North Sulawesi. Amazing. Amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Little> <laughs> yeah. so, so before that, so you said about working in Menado, 
I can't speak, the mm. Netherlands before. Mm. So have you always worked in other countries or was sort of, is it just something that you think is quite natural? I'm just going to go and live in that country now. <laughs> or is it? Well, before I worked in the Netherlands, I had spent um, four years doing seasonal work with Operation Wallace here. Oh, yeah. So I was a primatologist working with Dr. Nancy Priston on the Mokaka Okriata Brunasens, the Bhutan macaque in southeast okay. Sulawesi, yeah. in the Indonesian site for Operation Wallace here. So there I was there for about two or three months a year over the summer yeah. and helping to take out sort of research students, yeah. train them up, help them collect data. So... There I got that real insight into kind of research, primate research and conservation. Um, I knew I wanted to be involved in it, but after four years I thought, actually I'd really like to know the kind of the, the, the more exit to you, more about the, the primate pet trade and, and yeah. uh, captive management as well. So that's where I did some volunteer work at Stifting Up um, yeah. and, and it went from there really. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 just the, so in situ is when you're working with the animals, in the native habitat and then ex situ is essentially like the zoo isn't it That's so they're right. in the native yeah. habitat just to clarify exactly. that one okay so what do you like best about your job with Salamat Kanyaki then what's been the best bit of it oh, I have to say working with the local communities mm -hmm. so obviously conservation itself it's it's, it's incredibly complex mm. so you work with a huge range of different people doing very different things um Lots of different stakeholders, we call them. So there might be, uh, yeah, people working in the tourism department or um, in the government forestry, also with the local community leaders, tribal leaders, um, lots of the youth as well. So the young people and getting them to understand the importance and helping them to see the importance of this unique wildlife. Um, but yeah, I think just having those really enriching, wonderful experiences directly with the local communities and spending time in these sort of in the forest farms and uh, learning and being very humbled by the the social and cultural histories and their relationships yeah. with the natural world for me has been yeah such an incredible experience for sure so i mean it's, it's one thing to probably worth pointing out that would you say conservation is often more about people rather than the animals you, know, you tend to go into conservation thinking i'm going to go mm. and save the animals but <laughs> but would you say it's more of a people job when you're on the ground conservation yeah so if we think about it so conservation really is about reducing threats to maybe it's species habitats yeah. or an entire ecosystem yeah. um but really the, when, when we think about those threats those threats tend to be anthropogenic so human based um yeah. so most of those threats it might be hunting or it might be you know logging yeah. or some kind of pressure on the natural environment which is usually caused by certain behaviors or certain mm. practices um, collections of behaviors um, from human beings so really to be able to reduce those threats then it's very important to to work together with people and to understand people to understand those relationships with the natural world yeah. and how we can yeah live in a well, that word I was like harmony. I know it's a very yeah. nebulous term, but have a kind of a more of a harmonious relationship yeah. with the natural world. Um, it's certainly complex, but it's certainly about the people as well. Yeah. It doesn't go to say though that it's uh, understanding the animals and the species are not important. Yeah. So it's really really critical as well to to understand the um, the, the ecology, the behavioural ecology, and there's you know a lot of great people doing a lot of amazing work on understanding. Mm. Um, Macaca nigra, the, the, the yaki, um, but also many other species which are which are threatened. So yeah. it's all part of a complex story, really, and it's all all important. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so that's that's thinking about the best. Is there a worse side? Is there some part of it that you think actually that's a <laughs> horrid bit of it? Well, it's because of that complexity in conservation. Mm -hmm. It's also uh, it also makes it extremely challenging. Yeah. To be very much yeah. on your toes the whole time. Um, uh, there's a lot of pressures, there's a lot of uh, changeability. Certainly living in Indonesia as well, there's a lot of what we call rubber time, which is, uh, you say, jam karet, which means rubber time. Which is okay. basically means if you want to have a meeting or you want something <laughs> organised, then it might be, you say, we'll do it between 10 and 11, rather than like here, I come back to the UK and everyone's stressed out because it's like, 10 o'clock on the dot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of 
I can't, there's a pluses and minuses of that that sort of energy and that kind of yeah. working ethic mm. of, of being quite laid back and not being so stressed wow. and held up by time. I find we're quite yeah. constrained by time here in the West and, um, <laughs> and like we've got to be kept on our toes. But at the same time, can be a bit more hard to organise things. Yeah. And keep things a bit stressful. But I'd say maybe overall the most, the hardest bit, maybe the most challenging bit is the politics and bureaucracy. It's not easy doing conservation and supporting uh, kind of community development work in another country. And certainly how that has been tricky in Indonesia. And Salam Kanyaki's always put a lot of energy into working very closely with government, uh, making sure that all regulations are followed, yeah. that we're reporting and, you know, absolutely following all of the um, national legislation and, and also playing that critical role of supporting the government in their work. Yeah. Um, but it's it's never easy and there's always you know policies are changing and um, things yeah shift and, and move and yeah. yeah you've always got to have those kind of high level political meetings and, and navigate through that bureaucracy yeah. so that could be a harder part of it for sure so um i suppose living in indonesia is there a particular like what what, what made you take that step because you said you were in indonesia before with operation Wosia. Was it a big step to initially go, do you think? Or was it was it quite easy for you to go, you know what, I'm going to go and mm. I'm go work abroad? It's <laughs> a good question. Yeah, so it, I remember I did my undergraduate in Plymouth University, mm. uh, Biological Sciences, and it was actually Operation Wallace Year. I remember there, they had their sort of spokespeople came out and made this presentation about, you know, oh, to the undergraduates, oh, look, you could do your... You could do your uh, uh, dissertation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Was like, oh, wow. <laughs> it's fantastic. This is a, yeah, it's like, this looks so good. It's going to be lots of money. I just about went off in the bank. Let me, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's <laughs> raise some money. I'll do some bank packing and stuff. So um, I knew that I, it was just so appealing to me yeah. to go to the jungle and learn about monkeys. It was a great, it seemed like a really perfect opportunity. I knew I wanted yeah. to study primates in particular. Yeah. And although I was studying biology, I was really interested in anthropology and about, uh, uh, connection to nature mm. and um, about primates more specifically as well so that opportunity to collect the data and go out there for me was just such a it was like a, it was a no-brainer really. I was like let's do it <laughs> and obviously that was an incredible experience and I knew pretty soon that I, I could spend more time there that, it's yeah. easy to yeah. fall in love with Indonesia the beautiful nature the incredible volcanoes and rich um, you know, colourful, diverse rainforests, you know, amazing, unique species, the wonderful, smiling people, yeah. um, and, and beautiful culture. So there's so much to learn. It's, I mean, every day I feel like I've been just learning. It's yeah. Still, yeah. You know, even after a decade, you still go out there and you still feel humbled by the the learning experience. Yeah. Important mm. question: Can you mm. speak Indonesian? Ah, Lord of yes, I have. Sudah lancar bahasa Indonesia no, ya. Yes, <laughs> that's a yes. That's a yes. <laughs> Jangan ditanya ya, karena mungkin bisa wow. buat sesuatu yang nakal. Yeah, said. Okay. Um, said a very nice thing. It was. Yeah. <laughs> have some people listening in the uh, translating that like, oh no, <laughs> complaining. I yeah, said um, yes. So yeah, yeah. I, I did learn the language uh, when I was in Southeast Sulawesi. I spent yeah. a lot of time with the guides yeah. in the forest, following monkeys. Yeah. Sometimes when you follow a wild troop of monkeys, in particular. You don't find them for hours and hours and hours, so you're back and forth. The guys yeah. are learning English, yeah. and so there's a lot of banter, and you oh, just nice. share a few words. And it's a great way to learn. You just yeah. it's, it's all about being exposed and immersing yourself in the language. But in in North Sulawesi, they they speak Manadanese, so it's much kind of more colloquialized, almost slang version mm. of right. official uh, Indonesian. Yeah. Um, but that's that's fun. That's been fun to learn as well. <laughs> I can imagine. Mm. Um, so I, suppose, I think I said at the beginning about you having a, a real impact on conservation. I think it's probably worth saying just how successful Salamat Kanyaki is as one of our overseas projects. I mean, obviously, that's all down to you as you've been there for a decade. Well, a lot um, of people involved. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, a big part down to you. Can you highlight some of the some of the sort of successes that you you've seen with Salamat Kanyaki in your in your decade with them? Mm, well, it's certainly been an um, incredible journey to see the, the growth and exploration and expansion of, of the programme. And just yesterday I had a meeting with our, with our wonderful management team mm. over in Indonesia. And um, we've got so much going on now. It makes me reflect back on like, wow, we have grown so much. And there's just such huge opportunities. Mm. 
So just sort of a few highlights really. I mean, one of the places we started was, from was developing this species action plan. So conservation, it's because of its complexity, it's really important to understand those threats and then create a really solid plan into yeah. the long term. Um, like what, how, what steps are you going to take and what actions are related to um, answering those, uh, kind of reducing those threats essentially and answering those key questions. So that was a, a huge endeavour in itself, just developing a species action plan and um, Vicky Melfi, who, who was the founder for the programme, along with Helen Sampson before I came out, um, did a wonderful job of pulling the pieces together for that species action plan. And then myself and our teams, we started to develop. Um, we were the ones who were able to uh, get all the buy-in from the, the local stakeholders, uh, speak with the government, build those relationships. And then the, the Species Action Plan eventually was institutionalised by the uh, Indonesian Ministry of uh, Environment nice. and Forestry. So it's now their platform, their tool yeah. for yeah, the approach to protect the species. That must have been a proud moment. Yeah, yeah? absolutely, yeah. yeah. And it's, um, the, the species has, in, in the time that I've been there, has gone from being kind of a bit, a bit on the sidelines, yeah. not really recognised, a lot of local communities not really knowing who they are, thinking they were the, the small monkeys, the small monkeys, the Tarsi is like, no, not those ones, <laughs> um, to becoming a, a very iconic species yeah. and representative of the, of the province as well. So they, they are one of the national priority species for the Indonesian Biodiversity Directorate. And yeah, they've, they've consistently come up as the sort of focal species also for the um, local conservation agency from the Indonesian government as well. So that's been, you know, kind of a real cornerstone and then, yeah, as we've seen this, all the development of these different projects, so mm. our um, community conservation forums, uh, forest conservation community forums, who have just done such amazing work of being able to be spokespeople for, for the local community surrounding a key um, nature reserve in Tankoko. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very humbling to speak to them, to see their pride and them being, having this environmental identity and for them, you know, carrying the voice of their, their fellow community members and then being able to connect them, have a, provide them a bit of a bridge to, to the government and the authorities mm -hmm. and the corporate world, to those who are um, involved as well. Um, aside from that, I mean, we've developed long-term education programs um, steeped in and kind of foundations in behavioural theory and social science theory, which connects to my, my PhD and my doctoral research. Um, we've established ecotourism programs, mm -hmm. built an education centre. Um, we have worked in across ten different markets. We've one key achievement recently was having the declaration from Tomohon, which was infamous as an extreme market selling uh, okay. um, lots of wild meats. So working together with the authorities from the trade department and the local traders, so the yeah. sellers, um, they've taken down the sign which says Tomohon Extreme Market. And they've had public declarations that they no longer sell endangered or protected species. Nice. Uh, and they'll certainly be held accountable <laughs> <That's good. laughs> uh, to that yeah. as well. And uh, But it's very much about shifting that identity from consumption. So of, this of is selling meat. as bushmeat as opposed to pet, pet trades. Yes, yeah. yeah. So in the bushmeat market. So shifting that identity of consumption to pride in these local yeah. local unique wildlife. And we see that. All over the province now, like yeah. we, the monkeys they're really are known. Right in the top corner, aren't they? Sort of ways, like literally. They are, yeah. So very, yeah. yeah, geographically restricted to the northeastern tip in yeah. the in the across. Um, they do go into the, the next province, so it's um, North Sulawesi. Um, yeah. We got that. We've got the the two species of Negra sens and um, and Negra in this hybridisation zone. Yeah. Cool. Mm. So not much then. No, <laughs> that's just a very small. Uh, no, I can imagine there's even piece. more. Yes, yeah. yeah. so <laughs> but that's, that's just a whistle my, stop tour. My own interest. <laughs> yeah. uh, the species action plan is that something that they can use for? Because uh, quite a few macaque species, isn't there, in Sulawesi? So is that something that they can sort of take what you've produced for for the Sulawesi? We call them Sulawesi black macaques, but <laughs> macaque and nagra, or and then just transfer transport it across to other macaque species. It's definitely got value in terms of its um, applicability to other locations and to yeah. other species i'd say even for beyond the macaco genus yeah, as well okay. um, it, you know it's a solid sort of game plan which could be adapted and we'd be very very happy 
anyone was interested to share, you know, and to upscale yeah. that to, to other locations. Yeah. And we've certainly been speaking to other colleagues and researchers in, in other areas in Sudawesi about uh, yeah, approaches to conservation. And I have shared that plan with, with other researchers in other areas looking at different species as well. Um, it's certainly something that um, yeah, has high value of replicability as well. Yeah. Just a small piece of work there. Um, I suppose it's probably worth highlighting that, that obviously the macaques, this particular species of macaques is one that we are quite invested in because we've got the group here at Paynton. Um, we did have a group at Nuki that are actually living up here as well at the yep. moment. And also um, Holly, who is our research manager, looks after the, the ex situ population, mm. so the population within zoos. So it is a species that we really firmly believe in. And, and they're just... really sexy monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> They are, they are beautiful. Oh, yeah, I've worked with a lot of primate species, and I really like vervet monkeys. I love Barbie macaques. They really? really great characters. Um, <laughs> I've had all sorts of different. I, I'm really into gibbons. I did my master's oh, research yeah. in like central um, Kalimantan as well uh, with the Borneo Nature Foundation, yeah. and I followed gibbons and orangutans and uh, red langer monkeys as well. Nice. Amazing. Staring at bottoms, monkeys' bums. Yeah. yeah, I was doing a parasite study, so I was collecting fecal samples. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Literally staring at monkeys' bums all day. Waiting. It was like, yeah, that kind of a dream job. Um, <laughs> so they are incredible, the, the, the gibbons. But when you when you spend time with the with the yaki, with the macaque nuka, yeah. they are just extremely charismatic. And that sculpted face, the incredible punk mm, hair, funky hair. Yeah. and the, the heart-shaped bottom. I mean, you can't go wrong with monkey features. Uh, just, no, they are. They've got their up there, yeah. <laughs> they are a beautiful monkey. Yeah, there are yeah. some ugly monkeys in the world. Oh, snub-nosed. I don't know. Yeah. Snub-nosed Less monkeys. Less beautiful monkeys. Less beautiful. Oh, I know, on. I mean, I love them. They're some of my favourites. The golden snub-nosed monkey babies. Yeah, but they do look Very like someone's just... If the listeners aren't um, familiar with those, do check them out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In the show notes. <laughs> have you ever seen a proboscis monkey in the world? I have, oh. yes. Oh, wow. They Jealous. are, yeah. Jealous. Manyet Balanda, as they're called in Indonesian. They're the okay. Dutch monkeys because... Dutch people have large noses. Big noses, are okay. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> and they do Interesting. have this incredible, hence the name proboscis yeah. monkey. Yeah. Um, yeah. They have this very large, uh, uh, enthusiastic nose. Enthusiastic <laughs> 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 That's one way of describing yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, so, I'm so yeah, they're jealous. definitely ones to look up. Because they're, they're not one that do well in zoos, so I've mm, never no, seen don't. one, so I'm going to have to go mm. and just going to have to go to Indonesia. Mm. Oh. Despite their massive <laughs> pot bellies, they're surprisingly bold with their jumps as well. You're like, yeah. how are you doing that? They carry these big, huge pot bellies. <laughs> Amazing. We can't talk about primates all day, although I could. You could. Um, definitely okay. could. Definitely. Okay, so just thinking um, beyond Wild Planet Trust, then your your many other roles. Mm. Give us a bit of a, a bit of a rundown of your your other roles that you have at the moment. Then just to uh, give people an idea of sure. everything. <laughs> sure. So at the moment, I'm a um, research fellow at the University of Exeter mm-hmm. in the Geography Department. And that role sort of emerged from my seven years uh, doing my part-time PhD. Uh, so that was, I was exploring connectedness to nature. Um, so my part-time PhD, I'm very grateful, was supported by the World Planet Trust as well. So it was very much integrated and complementary to the conservation work that we're doing. Mm-hmm. The idea was really to to learn, go through that process of learning from the social sciences um, to be able to enhance our, our programme delivery, the, the strategy development, um, understanding some of this best practice which exists in the quite, sometimes quite hard to navigate yeah. social scientific world, um, make that translatable and useful into our conservation work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that was incredible experience doing the, the PhD. And then from there, um, I met, uh, Lewis Winks, Dr. Lewis Winks, who is now my business partner for Lestari, um, which is another Indonesian word, actually. So yeah, just both of my organizations. Yeah. yeah. So Lestari means um, everlasting, eternal, or sustainable. Oh. Um, it's a very beautiful word. It's very easy to pronounce. It's much mm-hmm. easier than Salamat Kanyaki. And so we set up Lestari a few years back. Um, ideally, really, to speak to our both of our sort of shared common desires to to work with environmental educators to provide some sort of yeah capacity building and also sharing of some of the the insights from the social sciences that we'd discovered yeah. through our doctoral research and looking at some of the best practice some of the literature some of these incredible studies which can really help practitioners to 
kind of enhance our, our communication mm. and enhance our delivery of environmental education. And there's such a, such a need for it at the time, at this, this time, yeah. particularly of, of yeah, biodiversity loss and the current sort of uh, climatic climate emergency that we're seeing right now. Mm. So, so yes, we are working um, at the moment on a number of different projects. One uh, we've been working on for the last couple of years, project uh, um, education uh, at the time of emergency, it's called. And that's an economic and social research council uh, mm. funded yeah. project working through the University of Exeter um, to build the community of practice in environmental educators in the southwest of England. So we're working with wildlife trusts, with Eden Project, working with that's weird things yeah. too, the wildlife <laughs> trust, of course, uh, and many others. So essentially exploring these different approaches um, through a mentoring journey, um, a number of different. Uh, activities and residentials and workshops yeah. to again to better equip the environmental educators who are doing such incredible work so, yeah yeah amazing. having been involved in it i think because the academic world is quite apart from the sort of on the ground if you like delivery mm. so it's this, personally it's been a really good bridge because mm. you've got you've got the time <laughs> and you have got the knowledge of all the the behind the scenes academic That's theory it, yes, and then it's yeah. just allowing us to to put exactly. It into yeah, there's so many amazing yeah. professionals who are so good at delivery and, and, and engaging with with the public and with with the young people. Mm. Um, but sometimes haven't got maybe the time to to really look yeah. at some of this best practice which is available. And I think that creating those bridges and making those connections is really integral. And that's certainly a big part of the work that we do yeah. at the Starry. So. This podcast is brought to you by Wild Planet Trust, a conservation charity based in the southwest of the UK with zoos in Paynton and Newquay local and national nature reserves, and field projects in the UK, Tanzania, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Vietnam, and Sulawesi. You can find out more on our website, www.wildplanettrust.org.uk. Um, okay, so going right back then, you've touched on a few bits already, but um, how did you actually get to do all of that amazing stuff? Let's go right back to the end of school. Let's end of school. school, okay. <laughs> well, if we talk about end of school, well... I had a little companion that I, I would bring around uh, with me during school. His name is Banana. Okay. Uh, Banana was a tiny little string-legged monkey, um, and he was very loved. So uh, <laughs> the old fan club, uh, and everyone who met Banana just fell in love with Banana. So that was my first. Um, and by the way, I'm not condoning keeping pet monkeys. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, absolutely, wild animals are not suitable as pets. <laughs> That's one of our key messages, um, as it does... It is one of the problems in North mm-hmm. Uh But at the time, I was a naive you know, student, and he was just made of cloth, so it may be a bit, a bit more suitable. <laughs> um, but uh, from Banana, <laughs> my monkey, he inspired me to, 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 to kind of explore primates and explore um, about the primate world. And I, I soon learned that over, over 50%, so more than half of the primate species globally are threatened with extinction. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to learn more about them, but then as I learned more about them, I also learned that how threatened they were, mm. and I, I kind of started to realise that the incredible work that people were doing to to protect them, and I felt compelled to be a part of that. Mm. So, yeah, I went on from school to to study uh, biological sciences at Plymouth University. That was where I had the opportunity to go to Operation Wallace here. Mm-hmm. Um, so not. Not before, though, that I did do my travelling, <laughs> the old, the the old, old gap, yeah. classic gap year, oh, where yeah. it was my first trip to Indonesia, yeah. uh, 2004. And yeah, during that time, I, I, I knew I fell in love with the tropics as well, and I knew I wanted to go back. Yeah. So then having that opportunity to go back with Operation Wallace here mm. um, was just incredibly enriching experience. It gave me the connections, the, the, the gave me a lot of powerful lessons about uh, primate research, about... Yeah, biodiversity loss as well, how to work with local communities, um, but it also gave me that experience of working with Sulawesi macaques. So after, well, during that time of those four years working with Operation Wallace here, I also had the two years working in at Stickling Arth as well after that. And then in 2011, I started the, the course, an MSc in Primate Conservation mm-hmm. at Oxford Brookes University. And that was just such a wonderful course. So incredible um, leaders on the course, really, really knowledgeable, well-connected. And it was just, 
I think because it was so specialised and yeah. felt like such a unique course, everyone was so into it and just really yeah. excelled in, in the in the in the, the course. masters I wanted to do, but I was already oh, down yeah. here, so oh, okay. I couldn't. I couldn't go and do it all. Still, no. you still, no, do, you still I, do. No, <laughs> I haven't I, had a masters. I, you did. I did my distance learning you one did. through well through Exeter. You know, oh, that's right. Yes. Done through zoology. So oh, yeah. yeah. I still got to do all primate stuff that's, because yeah, you could okay, do it yeah. once. I was like, primates, <laughs> yeah. primates, primates. Primate, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was it was a wonderful course, and that for me just gave me the foundation. I think to to know how to do conservation. <laughs> uh, yeah. So before it's like I knew about it, but it wasn't quite clear on the the. Yeah, the, the sort of technicalities and it really gives you a, a really good connections mm -hmm. as well, networks and sets you up. Um, and then, yeah, luckily straight after that, because I had that experience in, in Sulawesi mm -hmm. with the macaques, then that gave me the opportunity to work with Salamat Konyaki. So then the opening came up and yeah, it all went Amazing. from there. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so, so your PhD you did whilst working out in Indonesia. Did you decide you wanted to do a PhD or did somebody say, yeah, Harry, do a PhD? <laughs> uh, a bit of both actually, yeah. So I had in the back of my mind, I, I thought it would be a good opportunity. Um, I hadn't been pursuing it that much because I was always so busy with the, with the full-time role. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, my friends here in the World Planet Trust said, ah, there's a great new opening and we're looking to to strengthen our mm. academic support and research side from the conservation work and there's an opportunity for a, a part-time PhD well there was actually two PhDs there was a zoo advocacy and a conservation advocacy oh, okay. PhD at the time and it seemed like a really good fit so didn't need much thinking on it it's like well win-win for everyone really I guess yeah. Uh, yeah a fully supported PhD and then also meant that I was I was able to give my time and keep supporting the program and uh, and feed in all of those lessons from that from that study into the conservation yeah. work, which I really feel has really strengthened the way we approach the conservation challenges. Hmm. Cool. So I think it's um, so Kirsten in a previous podcast brought up the fact that you know it's not always about qualifications, and we probably should mention that because both, both Kirsten and yourself are, are very qualified people. Mm. Would you say qualifications have been are necessary you know would you have been able to get into your role without masters degrees phds would you say? No, i mean experience is extremely valuable and obviously there is a, a whole kind of currency of of academia um, and having qualifications yeah. can can help you stand <laughs> out but often to get those qualifications in the first place you need that experience and, yeah um, certainly for me i i the, my role at stick up originally was was voluntary um then i did some uh, managed to get a foot in the door and got a bit of paid work with them but I did spend a lot of hours doing voluntary work mm. um, and obviously the time in, in Operation Wallace here for the first couple of years as well was also voluntary so volunteering yourself internships and these opportunities to yeah. gain that experience is I think is equally as valuable as, as any qualification um, and it's yeah it's not just about what's written on paper but it's you know what they're in your memories and what yeah. lessons you've learned and what you can take home and what you can yeah. share with other people from your experiences. Mm. Um, so I suppose on, on that then, is, is there any particular extra skills do you think that have been just as useful as your qualifications? So anything that you've built through your time alongside? Mm, I'd say there's a few things that you have to do <laughs> as a conservationist. Um, two things that come to mind are public speaking yeah. so by that I mean doing presentations mm -hmm. and holding um, a space in front of a, a group of 100 erratic <laughs> Indonesian kids going screaming at you <laughs> ah, super excited to see the boule the white guy in the front yeah. <laughs> uh, so holding that space entertaining and um, and just sometimes doing more formal meetings is yeah. really important and developing that skill then it was also sort of navigating political meetings, as I mentioned earlier as well. Yeah. That's another tough one. And sometimes you can be kind of very restricted in, in what you can say or what you mm. can't say. And you can be uh, put into tight positions and you just have to navigate politically and uh, diplomatically to, to be able to reach the desired outcomes as well. Um, mm. On the side of things as well, kind of on another uh, maybe off kind of the more traditional kind of skill sets. Mm. Um, there's a lot of things I've learned to sort of keep balance with my, my working relationship as well. Um, so I've 
studied to be a Shinrin Yoko forest bathing guide and for me connecting with nature and the natural world is is really important yeah uh, it's yeah. part of also my sort of meditative practice as well as so a meditation yoga to keep yourself balanced and <laughs> yeah. tuned in I think it's important too well, you yeah. liked Indonesia exactly yeah. <laughs> beautiful nature <laughs> very mm. much so I mean you've already answered this but I'm going to ask you anyway did you always see yourself working in conservation was that always the end goal yeah I think so yes and I feel that conservation as well it's such a broad sector um, and certainly for me I've I've always just wanted to positively contribute to saving the planet in some way yeah. so conservation was obviously always a, a, a really good fit for that uh, and that's usually you know conservation projects are often species specific obviously we're doing a very holistic program of different activities and education and research and sustainable livelihoods yeah. and um, ecotourism and things so that covers lots and lots of species mm. but we have a flagship species approach which means that we promote the macaca negra the yaki of course and mm. focus on them um, as a representative to protect the forest but really i think for me um, i'm also kind of more now moving into environmentalism and thinking like how can how can i contribute to conservation by bio, biodiversity conservation but also strengthening our approaches more generally in terms of how we engage and how we understand uh, the relationships with the natural world yeah uh, and that's really deeply uh, connected to human behavior mm. so i've been certainly focusing a lot through my phd work and through the work of astari on yeah understanding those social cultural drivers so what are the what are the key things that um, the attitudes maybe the values social norms how all those things contribute to the expression of certain behaviors mm. and that's really key for conservation for environmentalism for any kind of social environmental justice approach or, or challenge really so yeah that's i think it's always something that's resonated deeply with me and I'm really very grateful to be involved in this work. Where do you see yourself going now then? Where's, where's the next 10 years going to take you? Next 10 years, oh, yeah. So, we, <laughs> tricky question so we've been doing this um, horizon scanning and visioning exercises with Lestari and yes, yeah, so certainly we want to to be more engaged in, in longer term projects, mm -hmm. um, increasing our impact and um, scaling up i mean one of the projects we're working on at the moment is working on a um, called coastal carbon capture so it's a carbon dioxide removal experimental uh, negative emission technology lots okay. of words there yeah. <laughs> essentially <laughs> taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere yeah. to reduce um, the overall net emissions that countries are giving off so there's some really interesting experimental um, technologies and we're helping to support project in the Caribbean um, on on understanding the impact and the, the the connections and involvement of local communities there. Mm -hmm. So being able to do more projects like that and having kind of real world big impacts, mm -hmm. um, continue supporting Salam Kanyaki and conservation work and yeah, I think integrating environmental education into the broader curriculum and kind of normalizing care and building a culture of care yeah. I think is certainly yeah. our, our goal and our overarching remit. Are you going to go live in the Caribbean next day? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Nice. Lovely. I think that's in the UK for, for a while. Stay here for <laughs> yeah. a bit. For a little bit. Oh, in the rain and the well, cold. It's get used to the song. It's all right. It's quite the same, isn't it? Beautiful seasons I've missed. Yeah. Can you, oh, do you reckon enough. there's a particular yeah, experience that you can pinpoint that you think was most influential then? point in your career where you were like yes hmm most influential um yeah i certainly think my my data collection for my phd so i did in what's called an immersive ethnographic study mm. so ethnography is about living with people and understanding exactly how they live yeah. and kind of learning from them living as they do and essentially getting all that information through that process of observing and discussing so it's not um, kind of 
traditional method of uh, asking questions and questionnaires, yeah. uh, more yeah. quantitative. It's a lot more qualitative, we say. Yeah. So it's understanding the stories and narratives that underpin those behaviours and those relationships with the natural world. And to spe- I spent 14 months all together in living with local communities and four different villages and r- rural locations. And it was extremely humbling how welcoming they were, how open they were, how how many incredible experiences I had just sometimes in a little hut in the middle of nowhere in their, in their, <laughs> in their forest farm and yeah. um, hearing about their stories of these mythical creatures and um, their uh, animistic roots. So the, the old religious systems and faith systems, which were much more um, connected to the natural world and the, the natural world had mm. spirits So every everything in, the, in nature had a spirit, the mountains, the rivers, the, yeah. the, the yeah. sky. Um, so l- hearing those stories and learning about that was was ex- incredible um, experience, very humbling, but also taught us a lot about how to, to, how to work with the local communities yeah. and how to understand them better. Amazing. Mm. There's quite a lot of taboos in, in that sort of culture, isn't it? They're quite mm. often, so often some animals, you struggle with conservation of them because there's a taboo attached to them. Have you got any of that sort of thing in? Yeah, there are. There's, there's all sorts of superstitions and lots of... Um, lots of um, yeah, some some are problematic. <laughs> some can be useful uh, yeah. in, in for conservation. Uh, sometimes there there's been sort of some views of, that consuming <coughs> meat is is going to give you make you powerful or energetic. Um, so those kind of myths are obviously quite destructive and yeah need to be sort of sensitively reconciled with with community members to to see and to help them to understand that there's no kind of yeah. evidence or scientific <laughs> support or backing to those claims <coughs> a lot with the Chinese medicine of course um, but then there's also these incredible superstitions of yeah the, the forests and the, the, the mythical creatures that lived in the forest and there was like orangutans that lived there in Sulawesi I was like hang on a minute <laughs> there's no orangutans here but apparently a lot of community members said there were these big orange uh, hair oh, wow. in there and um long long legged uh, creatures that crept through the night and ate the chickens livers uh, <laughs> interesting <laughs> yeah <laughs> and all sorts of uh, strange beasts and creatures and they've all got to have come from somewhere there haven't they superstitions yeah you wonder where those stories are coming yeah. from don't you <laughs> yeah, the one that always springs to mind when I think of taboos is like in Madagascar it's eye eyes isn't it oh, oh that's right. eye eyes are yes. considered evil spirits mm. and that's why they end up being hunted <laughs> There is actually, um, there's a village that I selected, it's called Popo Village in South Minahasa, and they previously had this um, tradition uh, of using, I guess we call them scarecrows, okay. so they create this, this huge leaves they would cut from this particular palm tree, very woody leaf, a huge leaf, and they would make these incredible masks, and um, they had this festival called Mawolai. And Mawalai was previously, they would have a dance, it'd be very noisy, they'd paint these masks and make these elaborate outfits and they would parade themselves through the farms to scare off uh, the monkeys yeah. as they oh, would wow. uh, be wild foraging or yeah. Yeah. foraging, we call it wild foraging. Um, <laughs> and that would be a way to kind of resolve some of those human wildlife interactions yeah. which can result in conflict situations sometimes. Um, so... But that's shifted now. This is a really important thing that working with those community members mm. and working with the leader of that cultural group, we've seen this amazing transformation from what was obviously emotions and connections and associations of animosity and um, seeing the monkeys sometimes even as pests mm-hmm. um, to ones of pride and actually celebrating the unique wildlife. So mm. now that everyone that's involved knows how unique they are, they know that they're endemic, so only found in North Sulawesi, um, protected and also critically endangered. And therefore, they are still doing the dance and promoting it to other areas around the province and even further afield, uh, but doing it in a way which comes with a conservation message. So it grabs attention, it's like, wow, look at these amazing monkey masks that they've got. Um, but really, it's to then express yeah. the, the, their pride in this unique species. Amazing. So you can see that, sh- that amazing shift yeah. in that yeah. relationship and the, and the associated emotions. Yeah. And that's something mm. you'd only get from actually spending time and immersing yourself with the community. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Amazing. <laughs> Needs to go even more now, don't I? <laughs> okay, so the, so for thinking for people that might be listening to this who are just at that kind of A level thinking about what to do mm. next, what kind of jobs do you think are going to exist in conservation in the future? Do you think there's going to be the same sorts of role as you've got now, or do you think it'll it'll change slightly? Well, I think conservation as a sector is diversifying um so it's we call it a meta discipline now mm -hmm. um so there's been this sort of, over this last decade or so there's been this what's called this renaissance of conservation biology which was previously dominated really from the natural sciences mm -hmm. so as we started the conversation learning about species about the ecology the behavior the geography the the monkeys themselves or the species themselves or the habitats um and that's really important but then it's, the natural sciences are very different to the social sciences. Mm. The social sciences are much more about understanding the psychology, human psychology, sociology, how humans behave and how societies work and operate. Um, then if we can tie those together, then there's that amazing emergence of uh, all sorts of disciplines like yeah. ethnoprimatology we see now, which is looking at amphrozoology. There you go. So <laughs> What we're seeing is these coming together of disciplines, and that's so crucial. And now that in itself creates new opportunities, new roles, and new diversification yeah. of um, approaches to, to tackling these complex uh, conservation challenges. And certainly I've seen that new emerging uh, positions, and I'm sure into the future as well, there's going to be more, more and more positions which are very much focused on that really holistic and sort of multifaceted conservation approach. And obviously, sadly, as we see the, the more and more habitats in decline, species threatened um, yeah. with increasing anthropogenic human pressures, mm -hmm. then there will be, I guess, a greater need for, for conservation. Yeah. We'd love to see a, a world which doesn't need conservation yeah. work, um, and where humans are living more harmoniously with nature. And I do believe that is possible, um, but it's still going to be some time before we, yeah. before we yeah. change our ways and shift into being more eco-centric. Yeah, because it's increasingly becoming more of a habitat approach, isn't it, rather than mm. a, a species approach. Yes. So it's, yeah. yeah, thinking of the habitat as a as a whole. Yes, and everything that's within it, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I think David Attenborough has been talking about that. Mm. Yes. And his plants, I don't do Green plants. Green planets. <laughs> plants are there to feed the monkeys. Uh, no. <laughs> oh. There you are. <laughs> okay, if you weren't working in conservation, what would you be? Tricky when you've always wanted to work in conservation. Oh, yeah. uh, what would I be? Um, that's a tricky one. That, uh, Tough question. Hmm. <laughs> I need to think on this one. <laughs> A that, dive uh, instructor, maybe? Dive instructor? Yo, maybe oh, a dive okay. instructor or a yoga instructor. Oh, yeah, okay. I think that would probably be, that would probably resonate well. <laughs> um, or, a, or a forest, I could do a full, be a full time forest bathing guide, maybe. Okay. So maybe. still on natural. Still on that kind of nature. So you can't ever leave the natural world. Oh, no. Yeah. Can't work in an office. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I do. <laughs> I, I do spend most of my time in the office, but it's a fair of mine. But yeah, um, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Put you on the spot now. What would you be, Joe? Um, I, <laughs> I think I said about <laughs> tables have turned. <laughs> yeah. Well, in an ideal world, I would have. I've, obviously, I love working in a zoo, but outside of this, I perform and things. So I think. Yeah. I would love to have gone into theatre, film, mm. TV stuff, Fair if enough. I could. I mean, if we're talking dream, then there's no reason why I couldn't do that. No. Fair mm. play. How about you? Uh, anything. Uh, I don't know. Uh, creative, basically. Obviously, what I do is creative now. Mm. But I'd go into something, like maybe even construction or something. Like that. Anything with my hands. Yeah. Okay. Like just building, building things or doing, doing something. Creating. Um, creating. Yeah. Event planning. That's what I would love to do. But that's a realistic one. <laughs> Honestly, I would, I would plan someone's wedding like a boss. I would love it. <laughs> <Nice>. Brilliant. <laughs> Go on then. Tie up with your last one. Okay, so obviously being a careers based podcast, we end with a very careers y based question. Mm. Um, what is your advice or what would your advice be to your fifteen year old self? 
Fucking your old self. I have some advice for you. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. Um, do not be afraid to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. I think there's everyone has those moments of self-doubt, uh, kind of dropping your self-esteem, wondering that, oh, I don't think I can do this. Or can I send that email to this person? Mm. They're really like, oh, they're really high up there. Like, should I do it? And that, for me, has been, I think, one of the biggest challenges, a bit like, just taking a step to just do it. Sometimes you might feel like you made a mistake or and obviously you do make mistakes, um, but just being humble in that and recognizing there's a lesson in everything. And yeah, I think to be, for me to, to get to that point where I had an opportunity for a professional role in conservation, then before that I spent a lot of time kind of emailing professionals and more experienced people mm trying to learn from them and being patient, recognizing that things take time and yeah, you've just got to put yourself out there and, and keep learning. So excellent advice. Um, and that brings us to our natural conclusion of this episode. But before we go, Harry, obviously, what is your kind of message? Where can people find you? What do you have to say to our audience? Yeah, well, thank you very much for, for listening and if everyone can support Salamat Konyaki, everyone who's listening and watching would be really grateful. Uh, you can go to salamatkanyaki.ngo. Uh, we might have to... We'll that, write it down that, somewhere. That, that, yeah. somewhere. <laughs> That'll be in the notes or on the screen, um, don't worry. And, and always really great if we can share our, our social media as well. So we have Facebook and Instagram and uh, YouTube and all of the, all of the social media channels. Um, so... Please do check that out, send some love, send some likes and promote the, the conservation for this incredible endangered, critically endangered monkey species. So yeah, we'll, you should we'll be able to there. find the information on our Wild Planet Trust website. Yep, there'll be information on uh, www.wildplanettrust.org.uk and then obviously there's your website and all the socials and they'll be all linked in the description or the show notes. Thank you so much. Excellent. So we'll call it there. Thank you very much, Harry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening or watching our podcast. If you enjoyed it, please consider leaving us a review. Or if you're watching, please hit the like button and leave us a comment about your favorite part of the episode. To get more content from Wild Planet Trust, please consider checking out our YouTube channel. You can subscribe there and you can also subscribe to our newsletter on our website. Of course, you can find Wild Planet Trust, Painting Zoo and Nuki Zoo on all main social media platforms and we'd really appreciate you checking those out as well all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching and of course we'll see you in the next episode